Mein Name ist Steven Neu. because they did so by taking away the very freedoms that we enjoy every day. Let me put my experience into context for you, because growing up as a Jew in Germany was a very different experience from anything you can imagine. But before telling you about me, let me tell you about my father, Arthur Louis Sr. Arthur was born in 1893. In 1900, he became a ward of the Auerbach Orphanage after his parents had died. At the time, Auerbach was run very similarly to a German army unit with uniforms and strict discipline. It was much more a juvenile military institution than a home. In 1914, after he finished college, he was drafted into the German army and fought in World War I. He was profoundly affected by the inhumanity that he saw. After his army service, he opened up a tobacco shop on Kopenikastrasse in Berlin. The shop was moderately successful, but only because he worked almost all the hours the shop was open. Now, Schmidt, how are you today? I am doing very well. You are here to pick up now, Schmidt, the guards. You always know. Where did you get them? I got a shipment and saved the best for my favorite customer. Here we go. Our favorite is it. Perry Hansen, how are you today? He would soon meet Gertrude, who would later become my mother. Gertrude came from a comfortable but not wealthy Protestant family. In 1921, their family gave the blessing for the marriage, though reluctantly, because Arthur was Jewish. We don't have a wedding picture. Yeah, two shots. I have an idea. Let me get the camera. Then how can you take it with your hands? No see. What are you doing? Look in the mirror. What are you doing? I don't want this One, dress. two, three. You're horrible. You're beautiful. I'm sure the picture will be perfect. In the 1920s, diseases that we consider to be nuisances, like strep throat, were potentially life-threatening. Many of the medicines that we take for granted, like antibiotics, had yet to be discovered. My mother developed rheumatic fever, which left her very weak. Arthur, I'm proud to you your Jewish. How will we raise our children? Well, the boys could be Jewish and the girls could be Protestant. Arthur, you're brilliant. 
We you know the doctor said we can't have children because of your rheumatic fever. Why do you ask? Well, Arthur, I'm not so sure the doctors know how much. Fortunately for me, my mother ignored the doctor's advice. And on March 11, 1925, I was born. By then, my father was making enough money at the tobacco shop to hire a maid named Charlotte, whom I loved very much, to take care of my mother and me. But my mother's illness got progressively worse, and she became weaker and weaker. When I was six, my father and I were at the tobacco shop, and we got the worst call a, a husband or a son could ever get. It was the hospital. My mother had died. I remember my father somehow made it to the shop door and locked it and turned the sign from open to closed. We cried in each other's arms for hours. Charlotte take care of me. He guaranteed a loan which my mother's brother defaulted on. Now in financial trouble, and seeing the cultural changes in Germany, he realized he couldn't properly care for me. So he decided to put me in the Auerbach orphanage where he himself had spent many years. There weren't a lot of options. He was an orphan at seven, and my Gentile relatives didn't want to care for me because they didn't want to be seen as helping a Jew, even though my father's financial problems were caused by helping them. To my father, an orphanage was the logical choice. Now, orphanages in the 30s in Germany were much more common than today, and certainly more common than the United States. Um, by the time I got to Auerbach, it was non-militaristic and religiously much more observant. Um, Auerbach was not a workhouse or a sweatshop, but it was far from a loving home I knew with my mother and father. You see here, that's the center core of this place. It separates the boys and girls' quarters. Stay here. I have to go sign some papers. leaving his only child, his only son, at the orphanage. But he knew I'd be safe there, and that must have given him the strength to put me there. When my father left, I got sick. Later that morning, I met the superintendent. Who are you? I'm Stephen B. Hi, Dick. We have too many boys by that name, so from now on, you'll be called by your middle name. Welcome to Alba, Stephen Louis. Next morning, I woke to a lack of nauseous spell. Get up. Get those bodies out of bed. Everyone lie up. We had to go to our assigned wash basin. Wash, clean the bowl, and polish the faucet. I brought four slices of bread with some butter on them to store every day. All I could think of was, this is all we get? Dinner was usually apple or pear stew or, or sometimes beef stew or the most horrible smelling herring you can possibly imagine. We used to take our herring and wrap it up in wax paper and shove it in the piano. We never got caught, which is pretty amazing because that piano must have reeked. At our back, children were hit very hard as punishments. If we did something wrong, they were hit in the back of the hands or the head with a stick or a ruler. But at our back, the worst punishment wasn't being hit. The worst punishment was prohibiting Sunday visits with our families. As soon as you look at Oxford, Thomas, and Dad, that's a broken, 
who I was visiting on Sunday. And many dads and their father loved me, and he was always happy to see me. On Sunday, I would take the Berlin State bus home and wait for my father. And we would go to park, visit relatives, and have men. At Araba, we would have a Sabbath meal every Friday. Every day we meet at Araba, we would listen to Mozart on record players, and always pick up the Turkish heart. We had one week we play four games of chess at the same time and blindfolded only in every day. When I was seven, after being at the orphanage for one year, the superintendent called me into his office. I'm sorry to tell you, but you will not be allowed to go home for a Sunday visit until further notice. I tried to keep you crying, but tears are down my face. My mind breaks. What have I done wrong to see this harshness of country? In my time on the Arabah, I've only been given half day visits at punishments twice. You have done nothing wrong. This request has come from your father. I was hurt, abandoned, furious, and scared. I tear into the secure thing at the person responsible for this. My father. The mother's family gives her a couple of times. Within a few years, a gentile world would soon cut all ties with me. They didn't weep. Maybe they were just scared of all the retribution from the Nazis. They couldn't help me. They couldn't fit in their own home. But they turned their back, and I've never forgiven them before saving me. Because I was thinking no family to have to visit. A little boy's mother at Arabah they took me home. Even though I hated my father, I was worried about him. Several months later, I learned the reason why I visited for cancer. Your father was put in a hard labor camp near Berlin called Aranyaboy, who targets Jews, socialists, and other enemies of the state. Why didn't you tell me? I'm an evil. I hated the Jews. You thought you would be less scared if you didn't know where he was. My father was severely beaten at Aranyaboy. He was punched in the face so many times his teeth were knocked out. The brutality was so severe he suffered a heart attack and received no medical attention whatsoever. Aranyaborg was not a death camp yet, but it was a hard labor camp and a brutal place to be. He was discharged a broken man. state-sponsored street gangs who terrorized Jews with no fear of, of legal retribution. A favorite practice of the Hitler Youth was to take off their belts that had large metal buckles on them and whip us at full force as we ran by. I can't tell you how much it hurt. The police just stood by and watched and protected those who hurt us. And if we defended ourselves, they would arrest us for hitting them. Child molesters quickly realized they could prey on Jewish children without fear. We all experienced a nightmare of pedophiles preying on us, though we didn't talk about it with each other at the time. I was molested twice, and even now, thinking about it hurts me very much. The message to all was clear. Do anything you want to the Jews and nothing will happen to you. 
I felt safe while I was in the Jewish school or the Jewish orphanage. It was the rest of my world that was scary and getting scarier every day. Stephen, I have some very bad news to tell you. Yes, brother? I am selling the tobacco shop. That's okay. You can start another one later. Soon Jews will not be able to own property, and people are taking advantage of the situation. The most anyone has offered me will pay our apartment rent for just four months. Don't take it. I'm afraid I'll have to accept it before Hitler takes it for free. One of the few bright spots in my life happened in 1938 when my father married Joanna. I loved her very much. She was always very, very kind to me. I never once referred to her as my stepmother. But despite these happy moments, we always lived in fear. When I was 13, on the day of my bar mitzvah, Joanna and Arthur and I were walking back to their second floor apartment. You read very well. I was so proud of you. I didn't know you were fluent in Hebrew. I studied Hebrew at Arba since I was six. Well, I am very proud of you, my son. Today, you are a man. Thank you, Father. Ah, well, Louis. Yes? Put your hand behind your back. I have done nothing wrong. Quiet. Where are you taking me? I said quiet. I'll be all right. Don't worry about me. Where are they taking you? To a concentration camp. Or worse. You know, I'm so scared. In the morning, we will talk to the authorities. The Nazis uh, just wanted to award Arthur the Front Cross, the, the uh, Frontline Soldiers Medal for his service in World War I. But at the time, the Nazis were so bent on dehumanizing the Jews that a summons for a reward was carried out in the same way as a summons for a criminal offense. And to make sure that he got no pleasure from the award, they threw him down an entire flight of stairs. The randomness of this incident scared us all very much. Joanna wrote to relatives in the United States who might help us. A few months later, November 9, 1938, Kristallnacht would occur, the night of broken glass. Some say this was the beginning of the end and the end of the beginning. Many look at this night as the start of the Holocaust. In retribution for a low-level diplomat in Paris is being killed, the Nazis held a pogrom, or state-sponsored riot against the Jews. The destruction and human suffering that occurred that night is beyond comprehension. Ninety-six Jews were killed. One thousand synagogues were burned down. Seven thousand five hundred Jewish businesses were destroyed. Thirty-six thousand Jewish men were arrested, many without charge. Many sent to Buchenwald, a concentration camp. Death to the Jews, Germany is, is for Germans, was seen everywhere. And for the men who hid, the police would arrest their children and hold them hostage at the police station. When the father went to, to collect the children, the children were released and the father was sent to Buchenwald. Nazi soldiers stormed Auerbach that night. They rounded up the children and told us all to get into the temple. Arthur snuck his way to Auerbach that night to make sure I was okay. 
He didn't find out until later that the Nazis tried to kill me and the other children in cold blood. While Arthur was out, Joanna heard a banging at her door. Just stop it. Open up now. Where is John? I do not know. I, I assume he went to work. Who else is here? Where are your children? We are recently married. We have no children. It was the Gestapo's practice to arrest Jewish men in the middle of the night. So Arthur made sure he left the house at 11 p.m. and would wander the streets until dawn every day. He and Joanna had made a plan in case the Gestapo was waiting for him. May I use the bathroom? Make it quick. Since I'm up, may I take the cover off the parrot's cage so we can get some light? Just do it. I first saw my signal and didn't come home worried about my safety. The next day, what I saw was unbelievable and sickening. Soon Jews lost all citizenship rights and were relegated to the status of German subjects. All Jews were forced to carry an ID stamped with a large J. All Jewish men were given the middle name Israel. All Jewish women were given the middle name Sarah. Hitler's final solution was now a reality. In 1939, Bert Clapper, a distant American cousin of Joanna's, agreed to be there and my sponsor in America. This was no small gesture on his part. He agreed to fully support the three of us financially. With this affidavit of support, we were granted visas to the United States conditional upon passing physical exams. But because of my father's heart attack at a running board, he had high blood pressure and was denied his visa. His visa would be in limbo until he could get medical clearance. About a year later, my parents thought it was too dangerous for me to live in Germany, so they arranged passage for me and 40 other boys to live in Paris. We were astounded to see that we would live in a little village near Quincy, near Paris, at the estate of the Comte de Montbresson who lived through the tyranny of the Tsars. When we went to the French school the next day, they asked if we spoke French, and we said we didn't. So they put us in the first grade, though we were between 10 and 14 years old. We learned to speak French in just a few months and joined our correct grades. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. World War II had begun. In May of 1940, after months of dieting, my father finally got his blood pressure down enough to use his visa. They left for the United States via Rotterdam, Holland that very day. At the time, Jews were allowed passage out of Germany for everything they owned. All their money, all their possessions, everything. The only thing they were allowed to take with them was what they were wearing, 
one small suitcase, and the equivalent of five American dollars. My parents had no way of contacting me. They, they didn't know where I was. But they thought I'd be safe in France. Two days after they were at sea, they got word that Hitler had attacked Holland, Belgium, and France, except for a small part himself. During the blitzkrieg of France, I could hear and feel the bombs exploding. It was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Now, I must tell you, I have a very bureaucratic mind. The rules were, one siren meant warning, two sirens meant the planes were overhead, and three meant bombs were actually falling. My father taught me not to look Jewish, not to read Yiddish newspapers, not to wear a skull cap or a prayer shawl. During the Blitzkrieg of France, even the Hitler youth left me alone because they thought I was German, because I would wear German-style leather pants and shoes. A few days later, the Count decided it was too dangerous for us to live in Quincy, so he arranged passage for us to Vichy, Free France. He negotiated with a barge captain to take us there. The 40 of us hid at the bottom of the barge, covered with a canvas tarp. After a while, the boat slowed to a stop. We could hear the unmistakable sound of German military boots above us. We were terrified they would take us to a concentration camp. And then one of the soldiers pulled off the canvas tarp and pointed his machine gun right at us. We dared not breathe. Mm. They look like a bunch of Jew boys. Fortunately, they too had bureaucratic minds. They were only looking for weapons that day, not to take prisoners, so they let us go. After several hours of not moving, the Count realized that we would not make it to Vichy because there were so many boats on the Seine River, it was log jammed. He decided the safest thing for us to do would be to go back to the chateau. But when we got to the chateau, we found a group of German military officers living there. These children are because they were drafted. They are filled with hate and don't buy into the Nazi mentality. We later found out that while some of the German officers were in Berlin, they would find our parents to let them know that their children were alive and well. Klaus, one of these soldiers visited your mother and father in Berlin. They are safe and wanted you to know that they love you and they miss you. We finally made it to Free France, all thanks to the American Quakers and the Society for training and development specifically designed to help refugee children. We were safe, but very hungry. All we had to eat was two slices of bread a day, some milk, and one small cube of beef a week. Because flour was in such short supply, in order to stretch the flour, they would add sawdust to it. And to be truthful, with each passing month, the flour content was diminishing. We finally settled in a little town near Limoges called Shaban. Fortunately, there were friendly farmers in the area, and we were able to steal and barter for potatoes and turnips. We stole more than we bartered. They're not the most appetizing or nutritious of foods, but it was better than being hungry. We didn't have DVDs or video games, but we would play soccer, go swimming, and take long walks in the woods. After a few months, I wrote to the International Red Cross and asked them if they could locate my parents. I told them that they would be in Berlin, in a concentration camp, or perhaps the United States. After a few months, I got the most wonderful present in the world, a letter from Joanna saying that they were alive and well and living in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and were trying to get a visa for me to come to see them. Getting a visa to the United States isn't as easy as one might think, especially during World War II. 
After two denials, Joanna went down to Washington to plead my case herself. She even wrote President Roosevelt a letter. And, then, and though he never responded, we later found out that Mrs. Roosevelt had used her influence to help me and other refugee children get visas. Joanna wrote a letter saying that my visa was waiting in Lyon, France. When I got there, the clerk was puzzled. After a very long time, the clerk returned. I went to Spain immediately through the help of the refugee organization. I took a boat to Morocco called the Serpa Pinto that held 700 mostly Jewish refugees. I later found out that just two weeks after I left Shaban, the Nazis stormed the house that we were staying in and took the 12 remaining children in my age group to several different concentration camps. Two of them were murdered. While we were on the Serpa Pinto, most ships would travel in darkness, but we would travel with large floodlights shining on our Portuguese flag, showing our neutrality. But even with our neutral flag, in the middle of the ocean, our worst fears were realized. A German sub popped out of the water, and the Nazis boarded the ship that contained 700 Jewish refugees. Well, we didn't have a gun, but it wouldn't have mattered, even if someone did. We were no match against a fully armed German U-boat that could easily sink us with one torpedo. We stood there. We were absolutely positively frightened. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know how long it would take. But we had to wait. What should you do I was 
assigned to General George S. Hatton's Third Army, Sixth Army Division. I will write you again when I can. Much love, Stephen. We endured constant engagement from the enemy. The Germans would shell us seven days a week, 24 hours a day, with very, very loud shells. It was their intention to terrify and sleep deprive us. It was a very effective strategy. We had to endure brutally severe winter weather conditions, the worst anyone could imagine. The enemy was desperate and knew it. Uh, the massacre from Malmody, in which many American GIs were shot point blank in the back of the heads, happened just a few miles from us. But even with all this, we would sit there every day. We would see American GIs' bodies piled up like cordwood at the side of the road, freshly killed. And all we could think of was, please God, don't let that be me. But within all that brutality, we achieved our final objective, the final defeat of Hitler, the fall of Berlin. Our division, the 3rd Army, was the first to liberate a concentration camp, Buchenwald. And even though we were battle-hardened soldiers, nothing could prepare us when we saw the sight of half-skeletal German, Jewish, Russian, mostly Jews, survivors in Buchenwald. The sight of half-dead people just shocked and sickened us. Some of the soldiers, in seeing the horrible conditions of the camp, became violently ill. The smell was of human waste and decaying bodies was indescribable and far worse than anything I have experienced since. We didn't know what to do for these poor people, so we gave them our rations. We didn't find out until later that their malnourished bodies needed to have vitamins and IVs for weeks or months before their bodies could handle food, so we ended up making them sick. Over the next few weeks, we would find the people who did this. It made me feel to bring these evil people to justice. Book of Old Citizens claimed they didn't know what was going on. My training says they must have been lying, but the shock that was on their face had to be real. General Eisenhower ordered film crews into all the concentration camps as they were being liberated. He wanted history to know the conditions that were inside the camps. What you're seeing today are some of the things I experienced that day.
survivors of the Holocaust tell their first-hand stories. Second, I want to remind people of what will happen if they do not act. What happened in Germany was not the last Holocaust. Rwanda, the Balkans, Darfur. Holocausts do not happen by accident. They happen over a very long period of time because societies allow them to. I want to remind people to act. It is my wish that if enough people hear my story, that there will be no more victims surviving evil. Thank you. 